published uh, just recently in uh, Cancer Discovery about last year in terms of looking at uh, small molecules that can actually activate T cells. And I'm going to talk a little bit about small cell uh, uh, lung cancer story that's uh, uh, also a high order CDK, a uh, CDK7 inhibitor, as well as a CRISPR screen that we're looking for for novel targets that can synthesize the PD1 blockade. Um, so this uh, story was actually done in collaboration with uh, Daniel Gray, as well as uh, Passignani when I was back at Dane Farber. We actually made a jerk of T cell uh, that over ex expressed PD-1, and then used this uh, cell line to actually screen uh, protein kinase, um, kinase inhibitors uh, that can uh, uh, activate these T cells. And we actually screened about 300 compounds. Um, obviously, the, 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 the biggest outlier of the screen was uh, GSK3 inhibitors that's been known uh, to be involved. GSK3 has been involved in, in the uh, uh, transcriptional activation IL2, so that was no surprise. But the biggest surprise, at least when I first looked at this data, was the, uh, the presence of CK46 inhibitors. I always had a really great uh, interest in 4-6 inhibitors that's outside of uh, non-small cell lung cancer, so to me this was a, a very big surprise. Um, so we actually uh, uh, validated this uh, screen by uh, looking at uh, different types of 4-6 inhibitors that were in various phases of clinical development and FDA approval, and show that all these uh, CK4-6 inhibitors can do the same thing, uh, has independent validation on these, uh, uh, on these, uh, uh, on these T cells. Uh, we actually also take healthy human donor cells, uh, donor T cells, uh, from our blood bank and actually did the same experiment and, and show that uh, you know, these uh, various CK46 inhibitors uh, can actually do the same thing. Uh, I won't go into uh, too much about the various different types of 46 inhibitors. Uh, they have different uh, uh, characteristics uh, in terms of their off-target uh, engagement. Uh, but uh, needless to say, um, many of these uh, 46 inhibitors have been approved by the FDA. Um, and also, we also use these uh, different uh, 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 inhibitors in this particular uh, assay that was uh, developed by Dr. David Bobby as well as Russ Jenkins. Uh, two really outstanding investigators at Daniel Barber, uh, in which they, we can grow these uh, organotypic cultures uh, from patients' uh, uh, lung cancer samples for short term. And I think I gave a, a description of this uh, when I gave a talk here about two and a half, three years ago. Um, we can actually use these organotypic cultures to actually assay what uh, small molecule inhibitors can actually do uh, to the tumor in the microenvironment. As you can see in this slide, uh, both polycyclic and tricyclic can actually uh, uh, induce a T1 uh, response uh, in these T cells that's grown in these organotypic cultures. Um, obviously, 4-6 has not made the, the, the inroads into the non-small cell lung cancer yet, uh, but most of the FDA approval has actually been in, uh, in uh, breast cancer, uh, in either in combination with estrogen, uh, uh, estrogen receptor antagonists. Uh, but it's actually going to be very important in terms of uh, cell cycle progression, especially working through RB. Uh, but uh, recent uh, publications, as well as work from many, many uh, 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 different laboratories have shown that uh, 46 can actually act uh, independently of RB status, so something to keep in mind. Um, so these are the different uh, drugs that we have used. Um, obviously, most of these drugs are now approved for, uh, uh, for the use in, in breast cancer. Um, but in terms of looking at these drugs, it actually showed that we can actually in increase it. Uh, so basically using gem models, in this case, KRAS P53 gem models that, that was initially uh, uh, developed by Dave Tuberson and Tyler Jacks, but subsequently being used by hundreds of labs. We can actually grow these tumors autotopically uh, by giving them an anocre and actually look at these lung cancers uh, it, it grown uh, the novel in the lung uh, uh, compartment. And we can actually uh, treat these mice uh, with different inhibitors, in this case, 4-6, uh, for a short period of time, then take out these lung cancer nodules, uh, making them into single cell suspension, and actually do flow uh, to characterize the different immune cell populations within these. And you can see that um, when you treat with 4-6 uh, for about three to four days, you can actually change the T cell ratio in, the, in, the, uh, in these uh, tumor immune microenvironment quite dramatically. Um, we also can show that we also change the T-Rex uh, within the tumor immune microenvironment uh, by, uh, by, by these flow assays. And it's actually interesting, we can actually do this both uh, in terms of tumor nodules as well as T cells that um, from, uh, from healthy human, uh, from healthy mouse <laughs> uh, 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 
cohorts and actually show that um, in healthy mice in which they don't have tumors, this activation is not as profound as in the T cells that's actually in the tumors. Uh, really su suggesting that this is uh, specific to the T cells within the tumor immune microenvironment, which is something that's actually really interesting, something that we continue to pursue. Um, so obviously, you know, the Jordan Native technology, and in this case, this is back in 2015, 2016 when we did it, we actually sorted the T cells from the different uh, uh, compartments, vehicle, untreated uh, uh, vehicle uh, uh, versus uh, tricyclic, and actually showed that the T cells actually have a very different uh, transcriptional signature upon treatment uh, with, uh, uh, in this case, polycyclic. And the transcriptional signature is actually uh, very, uh, very striking and it's actually shown that it's very uh, similar to uh, T cell activation in this case, as well as uh, a couple of other really interesting genes that seem to be activated. Again, we're pursuing those uh, novel genes at the moment. Um, obviously, you know, we, at, th at that point, uh, we're using syngenate models as such models and actually show that CK46 uh, in, in, in the proper dosing uh, schedule, actually can synergize quite dramatically with PD-1 in terms of shrinking tumors both in the MC38 as well as the CD26 uh, syngenetic model. Uh, but I should say that you can't really continuously dose with 4 6 inhibitor because one of the com most common side effects and one of the most well known side effects of continuous dosing is leukopenia. So we can actually dose transiently, activate your T cells, but you can't dose continuously because eventually those T cells will undergo cell cycle arrest. Um, so the other thing that which I did not show just for the interest of time, we actually have shown that the way CK46 activate T cells is by uh, inhibiting the phosphorylation and NFAT, which are transcriptional factors that are really important for the uh, activation of T cells. And we can actually show um, that different NFATs can be, can be uh, the transcriptional uh, programming of these different act, uh, NFATs can be inhibited by 4-6 inhibition. Uh, so that, again, was done, uh, work done by a very talented postdoctoral fellow in the Daniel Grace lab. So using the same idea, we actually have done the same thing with HTAC-6 inhibitors as well as BED inhibitors, which I won't go into today. And those stories have also been published that we can actually combine HTAC inhibitors with PD-1 and, uh, and, and get a very striking uh, synergy in the, in the preclinical models, as well as BED inhibitors plus PD-1. So I should say that uh, both of these three combinations, uh, at least two of the three combinations are actually in clinical trials right now. Uh, Lily's uh, benocyclic has been uh, is in clinical trial in combination with PD-1, um, as well as uh, each stack, um, uh, different each stack inhibitors in combination with PD-1. But the more important thing I want to really uh, stress is the dosing schedule of 4 6 is going to be really important. You can't continuously dose to have the immunomodulatory effect. You can have cancer intrinsic effect. Obviously, you know, in breast cancer, the, the most important thing is cell cycle arrest, and that's what they see uh, in breast cancer. Uh, it doesn't cause apoptosis. This class of compounds traditionally do not cause uh, cell, uh, cell death. The cell cycle arrest and maybe going to senescence, and that in itself may also be more modulatory uh, uh, process. So, for the second uh, story, uh, which is a story that's ongoing, is a, a continuing a, a work that we actually published back in 2014 now, in which we used a, the, um, the small cell uh, lung cancer models that was uh, originally developed by Anton Burns uh, back, you know, so long, uh, not that long ago, a couple of maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and really using uh, cell lines that we generate from those models to really screen, again, a, a kinase inhibitor library uh, to see um, what compounds might, might be synthetic uh, lethal to small cell lung cancer. And we, uh, in, in that series, we actually uh, fish out uh, CDK7. Um, it turns out, going back to this list, there's additional targets that might be very interesting to us. But we worked with CDK7 back then using a, 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 a interesting two compound called THC1, which actually hit CDK7, CDK12, and CDK13. So in working with Daniel and his lab, as well as other folks at Daniel Farber, we actually have further optimized this compound so that it doesn't hit uh, CDK12 and 13. Um, I should say that we also work with uh, the folks over at Mass General um, in terms of working out this story. Um, but we want to dissect out the, the effect of CDK7 versus its effect on CDK12 and 13. Obviously, CDK7 also impact on CDK12 and 13, as well as uh, CDK1 and 2 uh, due to CDK7 second age mad complex. 
but it, we want to dissect that, this out by using small molecules. And Nathaniel actually made a really highly specific and potent ZK7 inhibitor, what we call YKL124. Uh, and this actually can actually work strikingly, and I'm not going to go into biochemistry, do the cell cycle uh, uh, process and cellular transcriptional uh, elongation process, and basically impacting both CK1 and CK2. The interesting thing is we're dissecting out the biology of this two compound is it actually interacts with the MCMO, the aminoclonosome complex, which is involved in DNA replication and replication fork. And by storing this fork, we can actually show that this actually forms micro, uh, micronuclei and DNA damage. And we can actually uh, show this by single cell microscopy and, and showing these uh, this different foci, as well as looking at micronuclei um, after treatment with CK7 inhibition on different uh, small cell lung cancer uh, cell lines. Um, this is just an example of what we see. We see these uh, micronuclei that's outside the nucleus, and this is actually uh, dose and concentration dependent. And we also show that in a, in a cancer intrinsic manner, uh, these cells, after being uh, treated with YKL, actually uh, engage in a transcriptional program that's how, uh, that engages in the secretion of uh, in cytokines. Uh, both, uh, my glasses is not working that well, different chemokines and cytokines. And more importantly, uh, we can actually show that we can actually uh, combine YKL with PD-1 in both autotopic models of small cell lung cancer, which we can inject uh, transthoracically uh, right into the left lung to make a single cell nodule and show that the combination actually have a very, very striking synergy. Um, in addition, we actually did the same experiment, but after seven days of treatment, take out these lung cancer nodules and do single cell RNA-C. Um, so these experiments were done in the last six months, so the technology has gone along so far that we can actually do 10x on a, on a, on a pretty robust scale. And, and show that we can actually uh, provoke a, a very striking anti-T-cell um, T -cell response within the tumor remarkable environment uh, with the combination. Um, we can actually look at all the different combinations uh, by, the, uh, by combining the different treatment arms and what novel uh, T cells or other immune cells that has uh, gone into the uh, tumor immune microenvironment. Um, so I don't pretend to understand the math behind this, um, but this is done in collaboration with the uh, computational bioinformatics group, uh, both at NYU as well as at Dana Farber, uh, to look at uh, different uh, tumor intrinsic signaling pathways that seems to be activated. <coughs> And we can actually look and we can actually see the, the different immune cells in the transcriptional program that's being engaged by um, seeing both YKL as well as PD1. And you can see that um, there's a, quite a bit of uh, uh, reactivated or activated T cells. So in summary, this part of the talk, um, we actually show that uh, why can, uh, CK7 can, uh, inhib inhibition can impair DNA replication and cause DNA damage to micronuclear formation. And in consequence to that, it actually triggers immune res response that's intrinsic uh, to the cancer cells and produce a pro inflammatory cytokines and chemokines that recruits additional immune cells into the tumor immune microenvironment. Um, we show, at least in the mouse, that this uh, compound is well tolerated and can actually, in combination with PD-1, actually have pretty uh, striking efficacy activity. Um, so uh, there are CDK7 inhibitors that's in various stages of clinical development, um, and a couple of them actually has a single agent that's progressed through phase one clinical study. So hopefully in the near future, uh, a combination study will be uh, seen in the phase one study. So last thing, in the last five minutes, I go to quick the talk so I can make up some time that we lost uh, um, uh, in this session. Is we're actually doing this in a whole um, in, a, in a in a wholesale scale uh, by making cell lines from C fifty seven black six um, uh, genetically engineered mouse models of lung cancer, both in KRAS KRAS P fifty three, and in collaboration with a bunch of other folks, um, we've been trying for the last ten years to make each of all cell lines. Um, and hopefully with some of the new techniques that we have, we'll be able to make uh, some genetic each of all uh, mutant kinase uh, uh, cell lines uh, from these mouse models. 
But what we've been doing is actually using a library of uh, all the epigenetic modifiers that we can think of about uh, 500 genes of as well as along with control genes uh, to look at uh, epigenetic uh, uh, targets that actually may synergize with PD-1. And the strategy is relatively simple. Uh, we can actually make KRASP cell lines, put in Cas9, and then put in these uh, different uh, guides, CRISPR guides, and then do the screen both in uh, uh, black 6 rat one mouse as well as in C57 black 6 mouse, and either in control IG or in, in combination with PD1, and basically look for dropout or enrichment of the guides. And you can see, you can actually look at both um, uh, genes that act, actually activate cancer immunity by itself or synergize with PD-1. And we're actually in the process of looking through this data right now and looking for the lowest hanging fruit to validate the uh, two or three targets. Um, but looking all the validation and looking at all the uh, known targets that that's, uh, drop out or enrich in the screen, this seems to be a very robust assay to look for additional novel targets that we can go after. Uh, so with that, I'd um, like to thank all the collaborators, um, that not all of them on this particular uh, slide. This is just the ones that work on the CK7 story. Um, but um, obviously, I have a long going collaboration with Pasadena and Daniel Bray, uh, both on the uh, CK46 story as well as the EGFR story that we're building. So then, thank you for your attention. <laughs>